Hey, I'm Serenity and this is my channel and today we're joined by Holland, Clover, and Nova. And welcome back to another Ludicrous Atrocities. Today we're going to be discussing Charles Ponzi, the inventor of the Ponzi scheme, something you have to have heard at some point in your life. So let's get into it. Ludicrous Atrocities is a series on my channel where I find the most mind-boggling crimes ever committed. But the things these crimes all have in common is that they are mostly non-violent and the funniest crimes I've ever found. They are much more lighthearted. Basically, I know for a lot of people, the true crime genre can be hard to stomach. Most of the time you're hearing about the most deranged things happening to unsuspecting victims. This series is for those of you who want to get into the true crime genre, but can't hear about violent crimes. So I've gathered a list of non-violent crimes that are just humorous. Something illegal happened, but for the most part, in most of these stories, no one is harmed, at least not physically. Maybe financially they are. It's supposed to be a lighthearted series about me telling you a crime that hopefully teaches you some sort of history and you walk away without that heavy true crime case on your mind. So today we're talking about the modern day Ponzi scheme event Charles Ponzi. Buckle up, grab a blanket, which my dogs are cuddling, a snack, a drink, and let's get into it. So as you can guess, the term Ponzi scheme or pyramid scheme stems from Charles Ponzi himself and his crimes. Charles Ponzi was born Carlo Pietro Giovanni Gelambo Tilabando Ponzi. But obviously that is a mouthful and I don't speak Italian. So he just went by Charles Ponzi. He was born in Lugo Emiliano Rogamona, Kingdom of Italy on March 3rd, 1882, which makes him a Pisces. Charles told people he had come from a family in Parma, Italy, and his ancestors had been well off, that his mother still even went by the title Donna. But the family had subsequently fallen upon hard times and had little money left. He took a job as a postal worker early on, but soon was accepted into the University of Rome La Spezia in Rome, Italy. His richer friends considered the university a four-year vacation, and he was inclined to follow them all around town to the bars and cafes and even the opera. This resulted in Ponzi spending all of his money, and four years later, he was broke with no college degree because he would never attend his classes. During this time, a number of Italian boys were migrating to the U.S. and returning to Italy as rich people, making their fortunes in the States. Charles's family encouraged him to do the same, thereby returning his family to its long-lost, rich, wealthy glory. On November 15, 1903, Charles Ponzi arrived in Boston, Massachusetts. He was aboard the SS Vancouver. According to him, when he arrived, he only had $2.50 in his pocket, which is equivalent to $85 today. Now, for now, now on, I'm going to be mentioning a bunch of currencies in this video, but that was the money valued in the early 1900s. On the screen, I'm going to put the value in today's money just so I'm not repeating a lot of numbers. Charles had gambled away the rest of his life savings during the boat ride over. Now, he only spoke Italian, so he quickly learned English and spent the next few years doing odd jobs along the East Coast. Eventually, he took a job as a dishwasher in a restaurant where he slept on the kitchen floor at night. Charles managed to work his way up to the position of a waiter, but was fired for theft and shortchanging customers. This is where his life of crime began. Around the stage, Charles worked as a grocery clerk, a road drummer, sewing machine repairman, insurance salesman, factory hand, kitchen and dining room help. He would either be fired or quit before being fired from the job. He moved around a lot from Pittsburgh to New York to New Haven, Connecticut, and the Providence, Rhode Island. In 1907, after some years of failing to do well in the U.S., Charles moved to Montreal, Quebec, Canada. He became an assistant to to a teller in the newly opened Banco Zarossi, a bank located on St. Jacques Street by Lugini Zarossi, to service the influx of Italian immigrants arriving to the city. By this time, Charles had a charming personality and spoke English, Italian, and French, because up in Canada, Quebec, they speak French, just so you know, which helped him get a job at the Banco Zarossi. It was a while working at this bank, Charles first saw the scheme of robbing Peter to pay Paul, a saying still used today, but is better known as a Ponzi scheme. Lugini paid 6% interest on bank deposits, double the going rate at the time, and was growing rapidly as a result. Charles eventually rose to a bank manager, but soon found out the bank was in serious financial trouble because of a bad real estate loan, and that Lugini was funding the interest payments, not through profit on investments, but by using the money deposited in newly opened accounts. The bank eventually failed, and Lugini fled to Mexico with a large portion of the bank's money. Charles chose to stay in Montreal, and for some time lived in Lugini's house helping the man's abandoned family while he planned to return to the U.S. and start over. As Charles had no money, the move proved to be difficult. Eventually, he walked into the offices of a former Lugini customer, Canadian Warehousing, and found no one there. He wrote himself a check for $423.58 in a checkbook he found, forging the signature of Damon Foyner, 
director of the company. Confronted by the police who had taken note of his large expenditures just after the forged check was cashed, Charles held out his wrist up and said, I'm guilty. He ended up spending three years at St. Vincent de Paul Federal Penitentiary, a bleak facility located on the outskirts of Montreal. Rather than inform his mother of his imprisonment, he mailed her a letter saying that he found a job as a special assistant to the prison warden. After his release in 1911, Charles decided to return to the U.S. and soon got involved in a scheme to smuggle illegal Italian immigrants across the state's border. He was caught and spent two years in Italian prison where he became a translator for the warden. He was intercepting letters from a mobster named Ignazio the Wolf Lupo, who I actually mentioned in the last Ludicrous Atrocities video. Charles ended up befriending Lupo in prison and another prisoner named Charles W. Morse, and this man became a true role model to Charles Ponzi. Charles W. Morse actually was sentenced to prison for 15 years for breaking federal banking laws. Morse actually fooled prison doctors during medical exams by eating soap shavings to give the appearance of ill health and was released from prison. Charles Ponzi completed his prison term following his friend Charles W. Morse's release, having an additional month added to his term due to his inability to pay a $50 fine, which makes sense because $50 then is about $1,600 today, and that's a lot of money. After Charles was released from prison, he made his way back to Boston, Massachusetts. While working at a mining camp as a nurse, he came up with the idea of going to another mining camp, starting a public utility company there so that would supply water and power to the city and selling its stock. During this time, a fellow nurse named Pearl Gosted suffered severe burns in an accident. Despite not knowing her, Charles volunteered for two major operations to donate 122 square inches of his own skin from his back and legs to Pearl. This resulted in pleurisy, which is the inflammation of the membranes that surround the lungs and line the chest cavity. This can result in a sharp chest pain while breathing. Occasionally, the pain may be a constant dull ache. Other symptoms may include shortness of breath, cough, fever, or weight loss, depending on the underlying cause. He had also other complications from the operation, and Charles had lost his job due to them. Due to him losing the job, Charles continued to travel around looking for work. While in Boston, on Memorial Day weekend in 1917, 35-year-old Charles noticed a young woman on the street car platform, and he was instantly enamored. Her name was Rose Maria Gineco. She was a stenographer and came from a family of Italian-American immigrants who had a small fruit stall in downtown Boston. Charles didn't tell Rose about his years in jail, but his mother sent Rose a letter telling her of Charles's past. Nothing less, nine months later in February of 1918, the pair got married. For the next few months, Charles worked at several jobs, including his father-in-law's grocery store, an import-export company called J.R. Pool, before he thought up of the idea of selling advertising in large business listings to be sent to different various businesses. He was unable to sell this idea to any businesses and his company ended up failing. In the summer of 1919, Charles opened a small office at 27 School Street in Boston, Massachusetts, attempting to sell business ideas to contracts in Europe. He received a letter from a company in Spain asking about the advertising catalog, which included an international reply coupon or an IRC. IRCs are coupons that can be exchanged for one or more postage stamps, representing the minimum postage for an unregistered priority airmail letter of up to 20 grams sent to another Universal Postal Union or UPU member country. IRCs are accepted by all UPU member countries. IRCs were priced at the cost of the postage stamp in the company of purchase, but could be exchanged for stamps to cover the cost of postage in the country where they were redeemed. If these values were different, there was a potential profit. So basically what that means is if I were to send a letter to my family in Europe and I use an American postage stamp, the USPS, and they get the letter, I can send with them a coupon, another stamp that that is made for them to send me a letter back and it covers that cost. Let's say it's a stamp is 70 cents here and in Britain a stamp is 80 and the exchange rate that's a 10 cent difference and then you got to use the exchange rate. Right now I believe the euro is pretty even to the US dollar. So I could potentially save 10 cents by purchasing a IRC here for the letter to be sent back to me in Europe. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. It's not complicated but it's hard to explain. So this led to Charles finding a weakness in the the IRC system, which at least in principle gave him an opportunity to make money. Inflation after World War I decreased the cost of postage in Italy when exchanged into US dollars. So that IRC could be bought cheaply in Italy and exchanged for US stamps of higher value, which then could be sold. Charles claimed that the net profit on these transactions after expenses and exchange rates was in excess of 400%. He was attempting to profit by buying an asset at a lower price in one market and immediately selling it in a market where the price is higher. 
which is actually legal. Seeing this as an opportunity, Charles quit his job as a translator to set his IRC exchange scheme into motion. But he needed a large capital investment to buy IRCs at a lower performing European currencies. He first tried to borrow money from several banks, including the Hanover Trust Company, but they were not convinced to give Charles the money. So Charles chose to set up a stock company to raise money from the general public. He also went to several of his friends in Boston to ask for money and promised he would double their investment in 90 days. You can see where I'm going here. Charles later increased this to 45 days and at a 50% interest, thus doubling investments in three months in an environment when banks were only paying 5% annual interest. So to put that into perspective, Perspective, if I were to have put $100 in my savings account right now, in a year, I would only make $5 on that $100, which is 5%. Charles was promising 50% interest in less than two months. So that $100 would easily become $150 in 45 days. You can see why people wanted to invest. He told people the great returns available from postal reply coupons made such incredible profit easily. Some people invested and were paid off as promised, receiving $750 interest on initial investments of $1,250, so half of what they invested. In January of 1920, Charles started his own company called Securities Exchange Company, which was basically just used to promote his scheme, in which he sold stock or promissory notes advertising 50% interest after 90 days. The funds obtained from investors were supposed to be used to buy IRCs to redeem in the US. Instead, Ponzi used funds obtained from the new investors to pay off old investors, thus the pyramid. In the first month, 18 people invested in the company with a total of $1,800. Charles paid them off the very next month with the money obtained from the new set of investors from February. Charles soon set up an even larger office in Niles building on School Street. Word began to spread and investments increased rapidly, so he hired agents and paid them large commissions. Between February and March of 1920, the total amount of investments rose from $5,000 to $25,000. As the scheme grew, Charles hired more agents to seek out new investors in New England and in Jersey. At this time, investors were being paid high commission rates, which subsequently encouraged more people to invest. By May of 1920, Charles had made $420,000 thousand dollars by june of 1920 people had invested over 2.5 million dollars into charles's scheme by july 1920 he was ranking in a million dollars per week or in today's term and i have to tell you this one 13.3 million dollars a week in today's money and this amount just kept rising by the end of July 1920, he was approaching a million dollars per day or $13.3 million a day in today's currency. Charles began depositing his money into the Hoover Trust Bank of Boston, which was a small bank on Hoover Street in the mostly Italian north end of the city. Charles hoped that once the account was large enough, he could impose his will on the bank or even be made its president. He bought a controlling interest in the bank through himself and several friends after depositing $3 million. By July 1920, Charles had made millions of dollars through his scam. People were mortgaging their homes and investing their life savings just to invest with Charles Ponzi. Most people did not take their profits after the 90-day stint, but instead reinvested their earnings back into the scam. Meanwhile, Charles had set up branches for his company all the way from Maine to New Jersey. The company was bringing in fantastic sums of money each day, but the simplest financial analysis would have shown that the operation was truly running at a large loss of money. As long as money kept flowing in, existing investors could be paid with the new money. This was the only method Charles had to continue providing returns to existing investors, as he made no effort to generate legitimate profits. He just kept trying to get new investors. So Charles' initial investors consisted of working class immigrants like himself, and gradually as news traveled upwards, many Boston elites began to invest in the scheme. At the height, nearly 75% of Boston's police force had invested into the scheme. It also doesn't surprise me that officers would try to make a quick buck. Charles' investors included the people closest to him, like his very very own chauffeur named John Collins and his own brother-in-law, Rose's brother. Charles was indiscriminate about whom he allowed to invest, from young newspaper employees investing a few dollars to high net worth individuals like a banker from Lawrence, Kansas, who invested $10,000. Charles kept the scheme going by telling investors he had created an elaborate network
network of agents buying IRCs for him overseas that he could redeem in the US for a tidy profit. But as you can guess, there was no elaborate network of coupon buyers. In August of 1920, only eight months after starting, Charles made $15 million in investments. Though Ponzi was still paying back investors, mostly from money by new investors, he had not figured out a way to actually change IRCs into cash. The whole reason he started the business. He also realized that exchanging the coupons to money was logistically impossible. For example, for the initial 18 investors in January 1920, their $1,800 investment it would have taken 53,000 postal coupons to actually receive the arbitrary profits. For the following 15,000 investors that Charles had, he would have to fill a titanic sized ship with postal coupons just to ship them to the US from Europe. However, he had found that all the interest payments returned to him as investors just kept reinvesting the money. So with all that money he was making, Charles lived luxuriously. He bought a mansion in Lexington, Massachusetts, about 25 miles outside of Boston. The house had 12 rooms, servants, and a custom limo. He maintained accounts at several banks across New England, besides the Hoover Trust bank account he owned. He bought a locomotive bill, which was the finest car of the 1920s. He had initially bought two first-class tickets to Italy for a delayed honeymoon with Rose, but instead decided to change them to bring his mother from Italy to US in first-class stateroom on an ocean liner. His mother lived with him and Rose for some time in Lexington, but died shortly after. On July 31st, 1920, Charles told father Pasquique de Mila, the director of the Italian children's home in Jamaica Plain, that he would donate $100,000 in honor of his mother's legacy. Charles also bought a macaroni company and part of a wine company in an attempt to gain profit that could be used to repay the investors of his IRC scam. Charles's rapid rise naturally drew some suspicion when a Boston financial writer suggested there was no way Charles could legally deliver such high returns in a short period of time. He sued for liable and won $500,000 in damages. As liable law at the time placed the burden of proof on the writer and publisher, this effectively neutralized any serious probes into his dealings for some time. Nothing less, there were still signs of his eventual ruin. Joseph Daniels, a Boston furniture dealer who had given Charles furniture, which he could not afford to pay for, sued him in cash on the gold rush. The lawsuit was unsuccessful, but it did prompt people to begin asking how Charles could have gone from being penniless to being a millionaire in such a short span of time. There was a large withdrawal of their money on the securities exchange company as some investors decided to pull out. Charles paid them and the withdrawal stopped after he paid $1 billion out. On July 24th, 1920, the Boston Post printed an article on Charles and his scheme that bought in investors faster than ever. In this article, it pegged Charles's net worth at $8.5 million. At that time, he was making $250,000 a day. Charles's good fortune was increased by the fact that just below the article, which seemed to imply that Charles was indeed returning 50% on an investment after only 45 days, was a bank advertisement that stated that the bank was only paying 5% returns annually. The next business day after the article was published, Charles arrived at his office to find thousands of Bostonians waiting to give him their money. Less than a week later, the US Post Office Department announced new conversion rates for international postal reply coupons. Though officials said the rate exchange had nothing to do with Charles Ponzi. Despite the reprieve, a Boston Post acting publisher, Richard Gronzier, who was running the paper in the absence of his father, Edwin, its owner and publisher, and city editor, Eddie Dunn, were suspicious and assigned to investigate reporters to look into Charles Ponzi. He was also under investigation by the Massachusetts authorities, and on the day of the Boston Post printed its article, Charles met with state officials. He managed to defer officials from checking his business books by offering to stop taking money during the investigation. A fortunate choice as proper records were not being kept, so Charles had no list of who was investing money. Charles's offer temporarily calmed the suspicions of the state officials. However, the Boston Post launched its own investigation, which garnered bad press, causing Charles to decline accepting any new investors. On July 26, 1920, the Boston Post started a series of articles that asked questions about the operation of Charles's business. The paper contracted Clarence Barron, the financial journalist who headed Dow Jones and Company, to examine Charles's business. Clarence observed that though Charles was offering fantastic returns on investments, he himself was not investing into his own company. Clarence then noted that to cover the investors made with the Securities Exchange Company, 160 million postal reply coupons would have to be in circulation. However, only about 27,000 coupons were actually in circulation. The United States Post Office stated that postal reply coupons were not being bought in that quantity at home or abroad. The gross profit margin in percent 
spent on buying and selling each IRC was colossal. But the overhead required to handle the purchase and redemption of these items, which were of extremely low cost and were sold individually, would have exceeded the gross amount of profit. Clarence also noted that if Charles really was doing what he claimed to do, he would effectively be profiting at the expense of the either governments where he bought the coupons or the US government. For this reason, Clarence argued that even if Charles's operation was legitimate, it was immoral to take advantage of a government in this manner. So the attention of Daniel Gallagher, the US attorney for the District of Massachusetts, was on Charles Ponzi. Daniel commissioned Edwin Pride to audit the Securities Exchange Company's books, an effort made difficult by the fact Charles's bookkeeping system consisted merely of index cards with the investor's name. In the meantime, Ponzi had hired a publicist named William McMasters. However, William quickly became suspicious of Charles's endless talk of postal reply coupons, as well as the ongoing investigation against him. William later described Charles as a financial idiot who did not seem to know how to even add numbers together. Charles's fall began in late July of 1920, when William found several highly incriminating documents that indicated Charles was merely robbing Peter to pay Paul. William McMasters went to Grozier, the former employer, with his information. Grozier offered him $5,000 for his story, which was printed in the Boston Post on August 2nd, 1920. William's article declared Charles unable to pay his debts, reporting that while he claimed $7 million in liquidation funds, he was actually at least $2 million in debt. With interest factored in, William wrote, Charles was as much as $4.5 million in the red. The story started another massive withdrawal, which Charles paid off all in one day. Then he sped up plans to build a massive conglomerate that would encourage in baking and import export operations. Massachusetts Bank Commissioner Joseph Allen became concerned that if major withdrawals exhausted Charles's reserves, it would bring Boston's banking system to its knees. Joseph's suspicions were further raised when he found out a large number of Ponzi-controlled accounts had received more than $250,000 in loans from the Hoover Trust. This led Joseph to speculate that, that Charles was not nearly as well financed as he claimed. Since he was getting large loans from banks, he effectively controlled Controlled. Joseph ordered two bank examiners to keep an eye on Charles's accounts. On August 9, 1920, the bank examiners reported that enough investors had cashed their checks on Charles's main account that it was almost certain his account would become overdrawn. Joseph then ordered Hoover Trust not to pay out any more checks from Charles's main account. He also orchestrated involuntary bankruptcy filing by several small Ponzi investors. The move forced the Massachusetts Attorney General J. Weston Allen to release a statement that there was little to support Charles's claims of large scale dealings and postal coupons. State officials then invited Ponzi's note holders to come to the Massachusetts State House to give their names and addresses for the purpose of the investigation. On the same day, Charles received a preview of the audit, which revealed Charles was at least $7 million in debt. On August 11, 1920, Charles's scams all came crashing down. First, the Boston Post came out with a front page news story about his criminal activities in Montreal 13 years earlier, including his forgery conviction and his role as Zerosi's scam ridden bank. That afternoon, the bank commissioner Allen seized Hoover Trust due to numerous irregularities. The commissioner thus inadvertently foiled Charles's plan to borrow funds from the bank vault as a last resort in the event all other efforts to obtain funds failed. By the morning of August 12, 1920, Charles Ponzi's certificate of deposit at Harvard Trust, which had been worth about $1.5 million, was reduced to $1 million after bank officials tapped into it to cover the overdraft fees. Even if he had been able to convert the bank money into cash, he would have only about $4 million left in assets. Amid reports that Charles was about to be arrested any day, he surrendered to federal authorities that morning and accepted the audit figures. Charles Ponzi was charged with a mail fraud for sending letters to his victims telling them their money had matured. He was originally released on a $25,000 bail and was immediately rearrested on state charges of larceny for which he posted an additional $10,000 bond. After the Boston Post released the results of the audit, a bail's bondsman feared Charles might flee the country and withdrew the bail for the federal charges. Attorney General Allen declared that if Charles managed to regain his freedom, the state would seek additional charges and seek a bail high enough to ensure Charles would stay in custody. The news of Charles' arrest brought down five other banks in addition to Hoover Trust Company. Investors were practically wiped out, receiving less than 30 cents to the dollar that they invested. They lost about $20 million. In two federal indictments, Charles was charged with 86 counts of mail fraud and faced life imprisonment. 
At the urging of his wife, Rose, Charles pled guilty on November 1st, 1920 to a single count before Judge Clarence Hill, who declared before sentencing, here was a man that all the duties of seeking large money. He concocted a scheme which on his counsel's admission did defraud men and women. It will not help to have the world understanding that such a scheme as that can be carried out without receiving substantial punishment. Charles Ponzi was sentenced to five years in federal prison. He was released from prison after three and a half years and was almost immediately indicted on 22 more state charges of larceny, which came a surprise to Charles. He thought he had a deal calling for the state to drop any charges against him if he pleaded guilty to the federal charges. He sued, claiming that he would be facing double jeopardy if Massachusetts essentially retried him for the same offenses spelled out on the federal indictment. The case Ponzi versus Fessenden made it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. On March 27, 1922, the Supreme Court ruled that federal plea bargains have no standing regarding state charges. It also ruled that Charles Ponzi was not facing double jeopardy because Massachusetts was charging him with larceny while the federal government charged him with mail fraud, even though the charges implicated the same criminal operation. On October of 1922, Charles was tried on the first 10 larceny counts. Since he was insolvent, he served as his own attorney and speaking in persuasively as he had with his duped investors, was acquitted by the jury on all charges. He was tried a second time on five of the remaining charges and the jury was deadlocked. Charles was found guilty at a third trial and was sentenced to an additional seven to nine years in prison as a common and notorious thief. Remarkably, during his various prison terms, Charles continued to receive Christmas cards from some of his most gullible customers and investors, as well as requests from others to invest their money. There were efforts to have him deported as an undesirable immigrant in 1922. In September of 1925, Charles Ponzi was released on bail as he appealed the state conviction. He fled to the Springville neighborhood of Jacksonville, Florida, and launched the Charpon Land Syndicate, seeking to capitalize on the Florida land boom. He offered investors tiny tracts of land, some even underwater, and promised 200% on returns in 60 days. In reality, it was a scam that sold swamp land in Columbia County. Charles was indicted by a Duval County grand jury in February of 1926 and charged with violating Florida trust and security laws. A jury found him guilty on these securities charges and the judge sentenced him to a year in the Florida State Prison. Charles appealed his conviction and was freed after posting a $1,500 bond. Charles traveled to Tampa, Florida, where he shaved his head, grew a mustache, and tried to flee the country as a crewman on a merchant ship bound for Italy. However, he revealed his identity to a shipmate and word spread to a deputy sheriff who followed the ship to its last American port of call in New Orleans, Louisiana, and placed Charles under arrest. After his pleas to Calvin Coolidge and Benito Mussolini for deportation were ignored, he was sent back to Massachusetts to serve out his prison term. Charles served seven more years in prison. In the meantime, government investigators tried to trace his convoluted accounts to figure out how much money he had taken and where it had gone. They never managed to untangle it and could conclude only that millions had gone through his hands. Charles was released from prison in 1934. With the release came an immediate order to have him deported to Italy. He asked for a full pardon from the Massachusetts Governor Joseph B. Eli. However, on July 13th, 1934, Governor Eli turned the appeal down. Charles's charismatic confidence had faded and when he left the prison gates, it was met only by an angry crowd. He told reporters before he left, I went looking for trouble and I found it. On October 7th, 1934, Charles Ponzi was officially deported. Rose Ponzi stayed in the United States, finally divorced Charles Ponzi in 1937. She didn't want to leave Boston, Massachusetts and Charles was in no position to support her in any event. In Italy, Charles jumped from scheme to scheme, but little came of them. He eventually got a job in Brazil as an agent for Ala Littoria, the Italian state airline. During World War II, however, the airline's operation in the country was shut down after the British intelligence services intervened and Brazil sided with the Allies. During that time, Charles wrote his autobiography. Charles spent the last of years of his life in poverty, working occasionally as a translator. His health deteriorated, and in 1941, he had a heart attack that left him in considerably weakened. His eyesight began failing and by 1948, he was almost completely blind. A brain hemorrhage paralyzed his left leg and arm. On January 18th, 1949, Charles Ponzi died in a charity hospital in Rio de Janeiro, the hospital San Francisco de Assis, a federal university of Rio de Janeiro. As of January 27th, 2013, the U.S. Postal Service no longer sells IRCs. International reply coupons purchased in other countries may be exchanged in the U.S. for a first-class mail and international one ounce letter size stamp 
per coupon. So that is the story of Charles Ponzi. Let me know your thoughts and opinions down below. It was a lot of math and it was a lot of thinking, but overall, I think it's a very interesting story because you think of Ponzi schemes and you never really understand it. And to know he was making millions a day in less than nine months. It was crazy how fast this happened. So don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. All my social media is linked down below if you want to follow me at all. What other crazy crime do you want me to cover? Put an answer in the comment section below. And as always, a palette cleanser, the doggo picture of the day is this picture of Clover as he is trying to get out from under my bed. I'm currently rubbing his belly as we speak. All right, love you, mana kisses. Don't do anything stupid, and I'll see y'all next time. Bye.